Thank you again, Mr. Leiden. Shaded meanings, doublespeak, prevarications, obfuscations, disinformation, distortions, false impressions, misrepresentations, half-truths, in general, dishonesty. There are many, many other terms for what is simply also called lying. Many terms in the English language. Lies are all around us, aren't they? In the day we live in, if we watch the news any night, we see so many things that happen on the political realm and the realm of uh, communist countries and other areas of the world where lies are just everywhere. I won't turn, but in Psalm 116 and verse 11, the psalmist is speaking about a situation of frustration. And he makes a broad statement, it's a very general statement, but it was as if in the context of this psalm, he can't trust anybody, nobody is there that he can rely on. And he says, all men are liars. Now again, that's a sweeping generalization, but it was in a moment of frustration that the psalmist says that, all men are liars. Now maybe your thoughts drift momentarily when I'm introducing this, this topic today to the culture of politics. Uh, most countries have, as I just mentioned, uh, all kinds of issues that uh, if we see any objective news reporting, if there are any true journalists left in this country, they'll expose these things. And that's part of the health and well-being of a democracy and the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press, although we're seeing some things really break down and crumble in that area. There are the growing alliances to slander, discredit, and cancel organizations and individuals. The cancel culture is alive and well. Add to that the ongoing unseen war on civility, marching ahead the unseen war on Christianity. Well, sometimes it's more obvious. And the, uh, the war against minorities in certain categories that are even heightened in the last few months. A war on American history. Basically, the war on truth. There's a war on truth in the world, not just in the United States, but in the world. Think about the possibility that we're starting to see unfold little by little just in this last two weeks of news, uh, mainstream news or uh, just, just news on TV about the possible releasing of this COVID-19 uh, epidemic from a laboratory in Wuhan, China. Possibly, again, I'm saying the evidence is stacking up. And if it does turn out that it came from a virology lab in Wuhan, China, then that could be one of the greatest mass deceptions in our age so far. Now we know that there's a mass deception coming from Satan yet ahead on a spiritual level unlike any other. But right now we're looking at this pandemic killing millions and millions of people and there are a few brave people who have been trying to get to the bottom of it. It's a, it's, it's surrounded by lies, though, it really is. The whole world, once again, is moving in that direction. There's an online watch group that I've gone back to a couple of times called Transparency International. It updates a score every year of 180 nations. Every year they give it a score based on business practices and on professionals that feed into building up a uh, documentation on 180 countries on a score from zero to 100 of corruption. Zero is the most corrupt you can get. 100 would be a good score. A, a country that has less corruption, less bribery, uh, there are other things, money laundering, counterfeiting, cheating in business, voting scandals, that the more a country has of those, the lower the score gets. Well. Here are some of the best scoring countries in 2020. Again, these things vary from year to year, and it's compiled by a number of people's inputs. It's called a Corruption Perception Index. 
Last year, the best nations with the, the cleanest record are Denmark, 88 points, pretty good. New Zealand, also 88 points. Finland, 85 points. Switzerland, 85 points. Those are the top four best business practice countries that have been reported last year. The worst, they're all 15 points or below. Somalia, South Sudan, Syria, Yemen, Venezuela, way down at the bottom. Where does the United States fit? Our score was 67 points out of 100, 67. Now that's not the worst. The average across 180 countries is like 43. Uh, we're not doing great, are we? Now what's sad about this is that from year to year, the trend is getting worse and worse and worse. So I looked at last year's scores and I looked at those from 2013 and they're definitely going down across the board meaning more and more corruption and those scandals and the money laundering and counterfeiting and cheating in business and voting scandals around the world. And so it's very sad to see these things. In fact, two thirds of the 180 nations all scored below 50 points. It's very sad. Uh, then all this corruption erodes the ability for a democracy like the United States to function. It was President John Adams who spoke to a officer's group of the Massachusetts militia when he said this famous line. He said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And that is very true. Only a moral and religious people can sustain a democracy Otherwise, it turns into a totalitarian regime or a dictatorship. And still, the great majority in our nation call themselves Christians in this country. Now, the corrupt practices of the world have always put pressure on true Christians. They've always put pressure on our conduct and our way of thinking and our worldview. So that includes us today. In today's message, I'd like to share a close examination of three biblical examples or illustrations that had bad outcomes using deception no matter what the circumstances were. And they all involve David, King David, or before he became king. The title today is Deception's Unintended Consequences. Deceptions, unintended consequences. We're going to spend a lot of time, or a good focus of time, in 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles, would like to join me in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 45. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 45. While we're turning, the setting starts with young David's training. This sets the foundation. It's before he is to ascend to become Israel's next king after King Saul. Let's remember that the prophet Samuel was sent to this little village called Bethlehem by God to find the young man in the home of Jesse. He was a well-known man in the community. He had eight sons. And if you recall the, the interesting scenario, he goes in and he meets the family and he can't perceive yet which one God is going to point out is going to be the one to be anointed, next king of Israel. So he goes through all the seven sons and he says, do you have any others? Oh yeah, there's the youngest one. He's out in the field tending the sheep. Go get him. We're not going to sit down here until he comes. True enough, it was young David, the youngest of the eight sons, who God pointed out would be the one anointed king of Israel. He's just a youth. He comes in from the field. Can you imagine? There's no pageantry. There's no fanfare. They're standing there and uh, Saul, I mean, uh, Samuel pulls out his anointing oil and anoints him in front of the family. Then it's probably like, uh, okay, well, I, I got to get back out and attend the sheep again. I mean, there's no trumpet blasts. There's nothing. It's just, but he is going to be Israel's next king. Now, there's something else very important to keep in mind. In addition to this is the one God has chosen to be king, 
But also from that day forward, it says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. The Spirit of God was going to start working powerfully in young David and throughout the rest of his life. Now comes something between nine and 10, maybe seven to 10 or 11 years of training for David before he actually takes on the role of king. 1 Samuel 17, verse 45, we're getting there. It's when David comes up against Goliath on the battlefield. Now, you can read with me the inspiration that David has. Let's read this together. Verse 45, he's talking to Goliath, the giant of Gath. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Verse 47. All this assembly will know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give, it, give you into our hands. He's a midget standing up to this giant of Gath. Now remember, Gath, uh, the, the uh, Goliath comes out ahead of the army, the Philistine armies behind him, kind of hiding in his shadow. Uh, but this, uh, this giant says, well, what are you going to do? Bring me, uh, you know, a, a little pipsqueak like this little boy with no sword in his hand? Of course, we know what happens. David takes a smooth rock, stone, slings it, hits him in the head, knocks him down, cuts his head off with his own sword, with Goliath's own sword. And so then the rally cry goes out and the Israelites chase the Philistines. But we see an inspiration that comes straight from God to act that way. After that kind of valor and that kind of boldness, David uh, distinguished himself for the years to come as a young man of integrity, now in Saul's army. And David uh, was continuing to become more and more successful. Back one chapter, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 18. 1 Samuel 16, verse 18. The officer who brought notice to Saul about this young man named David. He says, he's skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person. And the Lord eternal is with him. This is the report an officer brought back to Saul, because Saul really didn't know this young man yet. Well, from Bible studies and commentaries, we can see that God had cho chosen David for some particular skills. He had a teachable heart. You might say particular talents. He had a teachable heart. He had the courage to shepherd his father's flock and defend against lion and bear. He made good judgments. He had a close relationship with God that was building up from his youth. There were qualities that God was going to use in a huge way. Now, chapters 19 and 20, we won't go there, but it describes that some time had passed now, that David is serving in Saul's army and his court. David has success after success. Saul becomes more and more jealous hateful over David's growing popularity among the people. Saul's jealousy continues to fester till a couple of times Saul tries to throw a spear and pin David against the wall and David escapes. This pride and envy that Saul was entertaining in his heart led to hatred, which it will do, and eventually to revenge and murder. This was on Saul's mind for years. And that's exactly what happened to Satan, isn't it? The same kind of attitude that brought Satan the hatred and the violence that he has to this day. That's what happened to Cain when he killed his brother Abel. This is now what is infecting Saul. Saul allows his impulses to control his judgment until he's overtaken by fury and anger. And this happens over and over again until David finally has to escape. He has these uncontrollable bouts with fear and rage, and then he falls into this state of despondency. 
and contempt and then remorse and the cycle happens over and over again. The tragedy would be that through 42 years of Saul's leadership over Israel, he never seems to gain control of his own human nature in that regard, rule over his own spirit. Never seems to in 42 years of leading Israel. Now let's move on to some issues. That's setting just the groundwork. Let's move on to a few issues that David has to deal with in his own spirit now. Things he has to overcome before he can be the leader of Israel and also lead Israel for a thousand years as a spirit being in God's kingdom. Paul reminds us in Romans 15 verse 4, I won't turn, Romans 15 verse 4, just a reference, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So what we're going to cover now for the remaining of my time are the things that were written for our learning. Let's now look at three cases of David's use of deception and the unintended consequences. Case number one of three. David finds himself in a situation of fear and doubt and he doesn't tell the truth. In fact, he tells an outright lie and the outcomes will seriously hurt other people. 1 Samuel 21 and verse 1. Let's go back over to 1 Samuel 21 and verse 1. Now David came to Nob. It says it's a city, but more than likely it's a little village, maybe three or 400 people. Now David came to Nob to Ahimelech, the high priest. And Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, why are you alone and why is nobody with you? Now let me give you a little more background here. I've already mentioned that David had escaped. Now he's a fugitive for years, running from Saul's army. David had begun by estimates this maybe seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 year period as a fugitive. And this little village of Dob was just a few way, miles away from where Saul was located, the king. And Nob was also the place where the tent of, or tabernacle of God was established at that time. It was kept at Nob. The high priest, Ahimelech, sensed that there was something seriously wrong for David to come by himself. He already knew that he had 600 soldiers in his band under his care. Verse 2, so David said to Ahimelech the priest, the king has ordered me on some business and has said to me, don't let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you or what I have commanded you. And I have been, I've directed my young men to such and such a place. Well, David at this point is, as we said, afraid of being discovered there. He's by himself. It might be easy to miss this, but he resorts to this deception because of his fear. David is telling the priest he had been sent by the king on some secret errand. Had the facts been plainly stated to the high priest Ahimelech, Ahimelech would have known what to do in regards to David's, uh, the risk of David's life. He would have known what to do. Here David manifests his lack of faith. It's a moment of human weakness, we might say. But how sad that the sin he's about to, well, that he's committing right now is placing Ahimelech in a very precarious position and the unintended consequences are going to come. We'll see in a moment. David, of course, is afraid for his life. He lies directly to the priest. The biblical principle so far in this message is no circumstance, no matter how grave, give permission in God's eyes to use deception. No circumstance, ever. Some of us that are raising children will hear when their kids come home from junior high and high school and they'll have conversations in some classroom where they said, oh, the teacher presented some uh, situational ethics or some uh, moral dilemmas. I remember them when I was in high school. We talk uh, among uh, our friends and we'd be uh, sometimes in a classroom. What if you were 
in a dangerous place and Nazis were coming and knocking on your door to drag you away? Would you, would you lie to them that you were hiding 10 people in the basement? You know, you have these scenarios or, or somebody is going to uh, come and, uh, and, and, and break into your house. Do you get a gun and do you point a gun at them? Those kinds of things are like, we're to train our children, don't go there. <laughs> Those are all misleading uh, scenarios. Uh, um, they're hypotheticals. God is able to protect and God is able to give us a presence of mind when we need it, when we pray, especially if we're praying in advance. We pray for our families for safety and protection and health and well-being. We don't have to worry about those, those what-if scenarios. And so here's a, one of these things where some people will look at David's actions as I go through this message today and say, well, these were, these were situational ethics. What would you do in that case? Well, God says deception is wrong. What's he say about liars? No liars will be in the kingdom of God. No liars will be in God's kingdom. So we're to teach our children that God will defend and God will protect, but he doesn't appreciate deception. Let's skip to 1 Samuel 21 verse 7. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. And his name was Doeg, the Edomite, the chief of the herdsmen who belonged to Saul. Now Doeg is a, you're going to see, is a very unethical, unscrupulous, um, shall we say an officer of David, uh, of Saul. He's his chief shepherd, but he also has other men uh, that he, uh, he commands around him and under him. And so this is a new danger there in Nob. Doeg was a foreigner, an Edomite. He had professed some kind of faith because he's going through some ceremony uh, of, of ritual there, paying his vows at the tabernacle, but he's a deceiver. At the sight of Doeg, David knows he'd better run. He's a dangerous man. He's got to run fast because he knew Doeg would tell Saul where David was. Everybody knew that David was a fugitive and that Saul was looking for him. So David asked the high priest Ahimelech if there was a sword or a spear there that he could take with him. Ahimelech offered the only one there, which was a sword David had taken from Goliath. It was kept there as an ornamental piece. It was wrapped in cloth behind the ephod as Ahimelech described. It's the only sword they had in the whole city of Nob. And he gave it to David. Here, this is the sword you cut off Goliath's head with. So what was the outcome now of this deception? Well, the first error is the doubt in God's protection. David had looked to God to remember, and I brought it up at the beginning as a foundation. Remember how bold David was when he went out into the field and confronted Goliath by himself. Very steady faith. He challenged the Philistine giant of Gath. Now the situation is one where David is a little more afraid. He is losing confidence in God's protection here. And so keep in mind too that God has already anointed David to take the throne of Israel. God is going to make it come to pass. He's not going to allow David to die an ignominious death before he's allowed to take the throne of Israel. This is one of those experiences that would help David realize his own personal weakness and learn total dependence on God, to see God's wisdom. And again, this is recorded for our example, to learn to trust in God. Now, we all occasionally fall into anxiety, uncertainty, even depression. But when we do, we're to take comfort and assurance in God's promises and in the comfort of his Holy Spirit, God promises to encourage the faint-hearted, to strengthen the feeble, to provide help in times of need. So many promises in the Bible in those areas. Isaiah 26.3, I'm not going to turn there. It's one of those very short passages, which is probably a very good memory passage. Isaiah 26.3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. 
And then verse 4 says, trust in the Lord eternal forever. For in Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. It's just a wonderful memory passage that God will keep us in perfect peace if our minds are stayed on him and his word of promise. So what happens next? Well, let's go forward to 1 Samuel 22, verse 8. Verse 8. David is discovered by this Doeg, the Edomite. Doeg goes to tell Saul, just as David predicted. Verse 8, all of you have conspired against me, Saul says to his army, and there's no one who reveals to me that my son, Jonathan, has made a covenant with this son of Jesse, and there is not one of you who, uh, who, who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day. You can sense some paranoia at this time that Saul has. He tells his army, how could you do this to me? How could you not tell me that my son is conspiring against me? And this uh, young man, David, who I put my trust in is a head of you know, a whole contingent in my army has, uh, has defected. None of you have told me this. Boo hoo. <laughs> That's Saul. So Saul is puzzled how it's so difficult to locate David. And he's paranoid about thinking that his own army is conspiring and protecting David. And verse 9 then answers Doeg the Edomite, who was set over the servants of Saul. And he says, I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitab. Remember, Ahimelech is the chief priest. He's the high priest. Verse 10, and he, Ahimelech, inquired of the Lord for him. Now, we didn't see that in the, in the text. We didn't see that in the narrative. Ahimelech did not inquire of God for David's sake. Now, we can see here that Doeg is twisting the truth in his own favor. Verse 11, so the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitab, and all his father's house, the priests who were in Nob, and they all came to the king. And Saul said to them, Here now, son of Ahitab, Ahimelech, in other words, he answered, Here I am, my lord. Then Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, that you have given him bread and the sword? Yes, he was given the showbread when he asked because he was hungry, and he was given the sword because he asked. But it says, And have inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Verse 14, Ahimelech answers. He says, and who among all of your servants is this faithful, as faithful as David is, who is the king's son-in-law, who goes out at your bidding, who is honorable in your house? Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Far be it from me. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to any in the house of my father, for your servant knew nothing of this, little or much. Ahimelech is being honest and forthright. He did not inquire of God to help David escape. And there's no accountability. And he should leave the, all the priests, all 85 of these priests of Nob, alone. Now the consequences of what David started with his deception. Next verse, verse 16. We're still in 1 Samuel twenty-two sixteen. 16. And the king, Saul, said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. Then the king said to the guards who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not tell it to me. Who started that story? Doeg. Doeg. But the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priests of the Lord. They were afraid to. And so the king says to Doeg, you turn and kill these priests. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck the priests and killed on that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. In other words, 85 priests. Not only that, verse 19, also Nob, the city of the priests, he struck with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and nursing infants, oxen and donkeys and sheep with the edge of the sword. So all their families, and I'm only estimated, there were 85 priests 
And they had families, children, and everything else. There could have been three or 400 people. What a dastardly thing that, that this dough egg did to destroy a whole town who was innocent, totally innocent. Well, how do we know it was David's deception that actually brought on this slaughter? Well, let's go to verse 20, 1 Samuel 22, verse 20. Now one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitab, named Abiathar, escaped and he fled to David. He got away, otherwise he would have been part of this slaughter. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the Lord's priests. So David said to Abiathar, I knew that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me, do not fear, for he who seeks my life seeks your life, but with me you shall be safe. Can you imagine that weighing heavily on David's heart, knowing that he, by his first deception, when he went to talk to the high priest, brought this whole thing on? Otherwise, Abiathar probably would have found a way to, uh, I'm sorry, Ahimelech, the high priest, would have found a way to protect David without introducing some falsehood because Ahimelech knew nothing about this. Deception will always have unintended consequences. And it would be David's distrust in God and the deceptive story he told Ahimelech, the priest that, and the pri- uh, well, the priest that caused the death of all these people. So it's very sad to see how David would have to learn from this bitter experience. Case number two of three. Here's a second case. It's following right on the heels of David running from the village of Nob. Now David escapes when he saw Doeg, this unscrupulous servant of Saul. David flees into enemy territory. He goes into Philistine land. And he goes right to the king of Gath, the king of the Philistines. Remember what was famous about Gath? Well, that was the home of the giant, the champion of the Philistines, Goliath. And here he goes to the king. What happens there? Well, David feels for some odd reason he's more safe in the midst of the enemies because Saul would not take his army and encroach searching for David into enemy territory. Well, at least that's how it turned out. So what's the outcome? Let's go back to 1 Samuel 21 and verse 10. 1 Samuel 21 verse 10. Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, is this not David, the king of the land? Now, we all know that this David was not king yet, but his fame of his military conquests had gone before him into lands beyond and uh, the people thought he was the champion of Israel. They thought more about David's legacy than they even knew about Saul apparently. And they would remember the song they would sing in dances saying Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his ten thousands. And so they're a little nervous. They're a little nervous about him. Psalm 56, I won't turn to it, but it describes this situation as David is actually captured by the men of Gath when he goes to approach the king, Achish. He's captured. He's a prisoner now. The princes of the land are revealing to the king that David could become a great danger to them. And so they seize him to stand before the king. And so it's uh, also reported this is the same man who killed Goliath, the giant, years before, and has led campaigns against the Philistines. Can you imagine how fame can bring a dilemma? Fame can bring predicaments in people's lives. In this case, David, oops, he's not king, but everyone in the Philistine territory thinks he's king of Israel. He's in danger. Verse 12, now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath, 
So he changed his behavior, behavior before them, pretending madness in their hands, scratching on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. Verse 14, then Akish said to his servants, look, you see the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman? Uh, do, I, do I need madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? It, were, it looked like it was something disgusting to Akish. He says, get him out of here. I don't, I don't want this man in my palace, in my house. Now, at first glance, when we first read this, we might think how clever David was to feign that he was insane in order for him to be released from his captivity or being killed. As this new trial comes upon David, his faith appears shaken again in another moment of human weakness, and we're going to see unintended consequences for this, again, another deception. Let's keep in mind that David, once again, has God's Holy Spirit working powerfully with him from the moment he was anointed by Samuel. And he also remember this, that he knows that God has promised him that he would be king of Israel. These are, these are confidences that, well, the second one is one that you and I don't have, but we have so many other promises in the Bible that God will look after his people. God requires that we abide in truthfulness, even in our greatest moment of peril. Truthfulness. So he feigns this madness or this insanity before a kish. And it's hard at first to see the unintended consequences. But what happened next? The Philistines were afraid of David more than they feared Saul and his armies. And he places himself under the protection of the Philistines. David, in doing this, exposes a weakness of the Israelites in an internal struggle between David and, and King Saul in Israel. And this encouraged further oppression of God's people of Israel. Thereafter, the Philistines would continue to be among David's worst enemies when he does rise to the throne of Israel for the rest of his life. Again, God works with David, and this experience is going to help David realize his human shortcomings and the necessity for constant dependency on God. David was learning wisdom in these experiences, but at a cost. There was a cost. Now, much of chapter 22 shows the movement of David and his band of 600 followers from place to place, trying constantly to dodge Saul's army. Samuel 22, verse 5, for Samuel 22, verse 5, the prophet Gad appears into the narrative for the first time. And Gad says to David, you need to go back to Israel. You need to leave the land of the Philistines and go back to your homeland of Judah. Now by chapter 27, David is emboldened somehow. We're not told exactly how or why, but he's not afraid of King Achish anymore. He goes back again a second time into Philistine territory, this time with this band of 600 men to dwell there again. Let's go on to case number three. Case number three, David using deception came up while he and his 600 followers and their families were back in Philistine territory. Let's go to 1 Samuel 27, and verse eight. 1 Samuel 27 and verse eight. Let's read together, verse 8. And David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, the Amalekites, for those nations were the inhabitants of the land from old. And you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. So these were heathen lands that uh, were going to be conquered in the whole conquest of Palestine, but... Interestingly, David and his 600 men do this from a base in Philistine territory. So they're living in the land of their enemies. 
and that they're going out and doing these raids and attacking some of these other uh, heathen groups or nations, and then they come back home. They, they say, okay, now here's the deception part. Verse 9, whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but he took away sheep and oxen and donkeys and camels and the apparel. And he returned and came to Achish, the king of the Philistines. And Achish would say, where have you made a raid today, David? David would say, against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jeremelites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. Well, well these were ancestor lands to, of Judah and to Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. And so these were Israelitish territories that David was telling the king of Gath that he was going in and raiding them. And so what's he saying here? He's saying that he's warring against his own people, his own Israelite people. David, again, is using deception and dealing with the Philistine king, who has built quite a trust in David, quite a trust here. Verse 11, let's continue. We're in 1 Samuel 27, verse 11. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us, saying, thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. Verse 12, so Achish believed David, saying, he has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. He's built such a confidence in David, but David is using deception here. From Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary on this situation, it says this, Achish, king of Gath, of the Philistines, believed David. Achish was deceived by the tale and considered that since it appeared that all Israel was out to kill David, Achish might now employ David against Saul and Israel. The gross deception practiced upon his royal host, meaning he was a host to the Philistine territory, and the indiscriminate slaughter which David had committed, lest anyone should escape and tell the real truth, exhibit an unfavorable view of David's integrity and uprightness in this period of his life. Deception has unintended consequences. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 29, verse 1. We already saw that David has built this trust with the king of Gath, Achish. David will now find himself between, as they say, between a rock and a hard place. He's going to be put in a very difficult spot. He's got to make a choice. He's there for a year and four months, it says in another place, in Philistine territory. The princes of Gath are getting very nervous. They don't feel the same sense of confidence as Achish the king does. The princes come and try to talk Achish out of allowing David and his 600 men to fight alongside the Philistines against a coming battle with Israel. David is still scheming here. Verse 1, Then the Philistines gathered together all their armies at Aphek, and the Israelites encamped by a fountain which is in Jezreel. The two sides are preparing for war to clash with one another. Verse 2, And the lords of the Philistines passed in review by hundreds and then by thousands, but David and his men passed in review at the rear with a kish, his little band of 600 men. Now David and his men had marched with the Philistines to the field where the battle was about to take place. As the two armies join ranks uh, across from each other, David finds himself in this predicament. He and his men are expected to fight now with the Philistines against Israel. What should he do? If David were to refuse to go up to the battle with the Philistines, he might be branded a coward. They might start getting more suspicious of why he was there. He might show ingratitude towards Achish, who seemed to favor David quite highly and protected and confided in him. What about the flip side of the coin? What if David took the battle against his own people? Well, he'd become a traitor to his own country, 
he would become the enemy of God by attacking Israel. He would be disqualified from being king of Israel. And should Saul be killed in the battle, who would get the blame? David would probably get the brunt of the blame for Saul's death. Unintended consequences. What's David going to do? This is a dilemma. Before we tell you what the outcome was, a key point of the message of the point to the point is very simple today. Righteousness simplifies life, but sin complicates life. Righteousness simplifies life, but sin complicates life. In other words, deception will bring unintended consequences in this case. Let's continue. Verse Samuel 29 and verse 3. 1 Samuel 29 verse 3. Here God is going to mercifully provide a way out for David and his men. David ends up not having to make that difficult choice. Who to go to battle against. Then the princes of the Philistines said, what are these Hebrews doing here? Meaning, why, O oh great king Achish, are you still allowing David and his men to be arrayed alongside of our soldiers against Israel? Verse 4, the princes of the Philistines were angry with the king, and persuaded him not to let David join the Philistines in battle, lest his men turn against them and become their adversary. So, uh, verse 8, King Achish explains all this to David. Verse 9, Achish answers, says to David, I know that you are as good in my sight as an angel of God. <laughs> Except his heart is not exactly pure, is it? Nevertheless, the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us into the battle. Now, now therefore, rise early in the morning with all of your master's servants who have come with you, and as soon as you get up early in the morning and have light, then just leave. Just, just sneak away. And this, uh, again, was a merciful way that God provided a way out for David. It's like saying, David, I really respect you. We have a good relationship. But to comfort the princes of the land, to appease them, don't take part on either side of this battle coming up. Still, David must have thought how unworthy a servant of God he was through these deceptions that he had stooped to. What if he had to make the choice of who to war against? God, again, gave him a way out. There was an online article I read called How Stuff Works, How Lying Works. It was a, uh, a, a survey of a number of studies of children of different ages into adulthood and the proclivity of lying and how it starts and how it, it can develop and how it can be uh, uh, deterred as, as people grow. And it says this, uh, it says, around age two or three, children realize that they're not under constant all observation by an all-knowing, all-seeing eye of truth. Meaning by age two or three, they know that once in a while, mom and dad turn their heads and get occupied with something else or, or that they're not watching everything going on. Little Timmy hit his sister. Mommy says, Timmy, why did you hit your sister? I didn't hit my sister and she saw him, ha she saw him do it. He, Timmy just doesn't realize mommy saw it happen. You know, this is a very simple thing that little kids start to do. Studies have shown that typical four-year-olds stretch the truth once every two hours. This is on... On, on studies of, of how children re react in social uh, uh, environments. Six-year-olds will typically tell a whopper every 90 minutes. <laughs> As children become older, they become more skilled at deception. And so the article goes on to explain the rationale people use to lie. There's, a category, or there's several reasons. One is to conceal misdeeds and to stay out of trouble avoiding responsibility or accountability for something. Another reason would be to preserve one's reputation, uh, to avoid being shamed or embarrassed. Another one would be to avoid hurting someone's feeling. In other words, lying to be polite. And a lot of people that uh, lead very upright lives even get caught up in that sometimes, lying to be polite. Oh, you're, 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 you're uh, your lemonade was just wonderful. 
In, in, in reality, it wasn't anything that was tolerable at all. But you know what? That's just lying to be polite. To increase one's stature and reputation, lies told to gain favor and esteem from others. To manipulate lies that are told to gain wealth or love or affection or favor or other assets from people. To control information, this would be indirect lying by holding back important information. And as a reaction to fear, people can resort to lying and deceiving, which is what David had been doing here. And so again, that's an interesting article, How Stuff Works, How Lying Works. Now, David learned his lessons. We're going to look at a, several psalms now at this point. Psalm 15 and verse 1. Psalm 15 and verse 1. We don't come back to 1 Samuel anymore. Psalm 15 and verse 1. You know, as soon as I say that, well, I might have one more passage from... I go to 2 Samuel. Ah, saved. I, I'm saved on that one. We go to 2 Samuel one time. But if you'd like to join me in Psalm 15, verse 1, as we're turning there, did David eventually learn important lessons that he could rule justly and equitably by? And to show that he had more and more faith in God and trust in God to deliver him from troubles? It's a rhetorical question. Yes, indeed. And he expresses this in various psalms. Psalm 15, verse 1, a psalm of David. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? The answer, verse 2. He who walks uprightly and who works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. But he honors those who fear the Lord eternal. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change, the NIV puts it this way, he who keeps his oath even when it hurts. Verse 5, he who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things shall never be moved. It's one of many Psalms of David that show he is growing in his confidence in God and God's promises and God's ability to protect and defend him. Skip to Psalm 52, verse 1. Psalm 52 and verse 1. This is a later psalm. He writes about Doeg, the unprincipled Edomite, Doeg, who lied to Saul about the high priest of Israel and who slaughtered the 85 priests and their families. Notice the references to lying and deceit here. Verse 1, we're in Psalm 52, verse 1. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. You love evil more than good, lying more than speaking righteousness. You think David would have been justified in writing that psalm about the same time as he was doing the same thing? Probably not. Some of these psalms probably are reflections on his earlier life and again, the things he had learned over these experiences and that are recorded for our admonition. Psalm 101, verse one. Psalm 101 and verse one. David says, I will sing of mercy and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. You see, David would learn to conduct himself in his private life with an upright and blameless heart before God. Verse 3. We're in Psalm 101, verse 3. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Verse 4. A perverse heart will depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Then verses 5 through 8, it's almost as if David is speaking God's words through him. And of course, in inspiration, he, it's exactly what he's doing. Uh, 
It's almost as if God were speaking as a perfect judge and ruler through David. In verse 5, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. Pride and slander go together, we see, because putting down others often comes from a motive of wanting to exalt the self, some insecurity, wanting to look better than others. Let's continue verse 6. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. You see how David is speaking as if it were God speaking through him. So in, in, a, in, a, in a physical sense, David perhaps is surrounding himself with servants and counselors who are also honest and will not lie to David or will not lie for David. Verse 7, he who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Again, David will not tolerate at this point in his life any deceit in his household among his family or his servants. Verse 8, early I will destroy all the wicked of the land that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. Here's David in his public role as ruler over Israel. He's vigilant to suppress evil in the land, especially in and around Jerusalem. To conclude today, the Psalms written by David clearly point out that it's through these personal experiences and these stumbling moments, these moments of human weakness that he learns honesty and integrity and he shares it with us. From his early years as a fugitive from Saul, again, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years, the Bible's not clear on how long David had to run, but it was a number of years. And to escape Saul's hatred and his jealousy, and he becomes mature to a point where he's able to rule Israel. David would learn to judge with fairness and equity. We recall once again, Saul's anointing of David when he was very young with that oil, up until Saul's death, David goes through these very trying experiences to temper him, to prepare him for rulership. And we live in a society that naturally tends to pull all of us down. It will drag us down if we let it. The influences that the world has on us is something to be constantly vigilant about. Honesty and integrity can challenge and corrupt us if we let it. And it does to many people around us. In fact, most people go through life not even recognizing that their personal view of their own conduct is affected by society around them. Most people go through life not even aware that society is having an effect, a negative effect on them through media, through other influences, through keeping bad company, which uh, ruins good morals, it says in the Bible, uh, secularized American culture around us, distortions in law, politics, false, fake science, if you will, evolutionary theory. These things are encroaching on everyday life. God shows us we need constant vigilance against that pull. So there's never a good reason to resort to deceptions, lies, shaded meanings, false impressions, doublespeak, dishonesty coming from our lips. They will bring unintended consequences. Instead, God wants us to learn to trust him and his word. When we have those doubts, those fears and anxieties, perplexities in life, and which we all do from time to time, all the great leaders of the Bible who went through years of preparation for large-scale responsibilities and tasks. Look at them for a moment. Abraham, he had to learn some of these lessons in deception. Joseph, he went 13 years before he was placed in a major position of leadership under Pharaoh himself. Moses, 40 years of preparation before he could come back and God sent him back to lead Israelites out of Egypt. 
David, again, seven to 11 years, roughly. We don't know exactly how many, but he had to be trained and tempered for rulership. So must we. Like David's teachable moments that were preparing him to rule over Israel, we too are in constant training for the time that we're placed in positions of leadership for a thousand years. Among David's very last words, according to, or recorded in the Bible, just before he died, he repeated what it says God told him. I won't turn, but it is 2 Samuel 23, verse 3. 2 Samuel 23, verse 3. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. 